Hello, we welcome you to the lesson today. If you will, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther, chapter 2. Last time in chapter 1, we saw the feasts of King Ahasuerus in verses 1 to 9. In verses 10 to 12, we see the refusal of Queen Vashti to come before them at the feast to show her beauty. And in verses 13 to 22, we see the royal decree. In verses 13 to 22, the royal decree against Vashti that another be chosen in her place as queen. Beginning with verse 1, verses 1 to 18, we see how the king made Esther queen. You remember in Esther 1 and verse 12, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. And so verse 1, the author wrote, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. And so the author wrote, after these things. This appears to be sometime after the royal decree of King Ahasuerus against Vashti in chapter 1, verses 13 to 22. By this time, his wrath had subsided, and he remembered Vashti, what she had done in refusing to come, and what he decreed against her. In chapter 2, verse 2, then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And so the servants of King Ahasuerus suggested that these women be sought for the king. He could order his officers to search for women who would please him. Verse 3, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's, women's quarters, under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. And so the servants suggest to the king that he could appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom. Remember, there were 127 provinces of Persia. That they would bring the women to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters. Hegai, the king's eunuch, was said to be the custodian of the women. He would guard, that is, watch over and protect these women. He says the servants suggested that the women could be given beauty preparations. The term suggests a cleansing, and so this would include some cleansing rituals. Uh, some versions suggest cosmetics, but we see at the very word that the idea of cleansing is included in these beauty preparations. So perhaps the cleansing and along with the cosmetics. But we see that these preparations could be given to these already beautiful young women. And so they could be brought to the women's quarters. Verse 4. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. So the servants suggest to the king, King Ahasuerus, that he could choose the young woman who pleased him to be king or to be queen. We see from the text that King Ahasuerus was pleased by the suggestion of his servants, and he did as was suggested. suggested. It was always his choice as king. Verse 5, in Shushan, the citadel was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And so Mordecai's ancestor, 
his ancestors are indicated in his passage. It says here that there was a Jew in Shushan whose name was Mordecai, and it describes his lineage. It describes the ancestors of Mordecai, how that he was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Verse 6, we see Mordecai's ancestor, Kish, was carried away by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, this occurred some more than 100 years prior to the events of this chapter, with the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC. So more than 100 years earlier, uh, we see the people being carried away by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. And so at that time, Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar ruled in Babylon. Now later on, we see in, in this book how that King Ahasuerus ruled in Persia, the Persian Empire of the day. And so about 100 years prior to the events, we see listed here that this will have been, these people have been carried away from Jerusalem. Uh, note that in the New King James, the term Kish has been provided by the translators. Uh, the italic type indicates that the term is not in the original Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, however, the Translators, translators evidently thought that the text referred to Kish, and so they added the name for clarity. Uh, the text is literally who, who had been carried away. Um, however, most likely Kish is indicated here in this passage as provided. Uh, possibly it could refer to any, any of the ancestors. Uh, given the, the long passage of time since they were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar, the person in view was, was most likely not Mordecai, unless he was very old, uh, but most likely his ancestor, such ancestor as Kish. Verse 7, and Mordecai had, been, had brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, the young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. And so Mordecai brought up Hadasha, that is Esther. And so that was her Jewish name. Uh, she was Mordecai's uncle's daughter. That would make Esther a cousin to Mordecai. When her father and mother died, Mordecai, her cousin, Mordecai took his cousin, Esther, as his own daughter. The author of the book described Esther as being a young woman who was said to be lovely and beautiful. She must have been a very young woman or young uh, girl when her father and mother had died, as she was a young woman at this time and her cousin Mordecai brought her up as, her, as his own daughter. The father of Esther, by the way, according to Esther 2 and 15, was Abihel. Verse 8, so it was when the king's command and decree was heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Higai, that Esther also was taken into the king's palace, into the care of Higai, the custodian of the women. And so the decree was to gather all the young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's, women's quarter, and under the custody of Higai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, according to chapter 2 and verse 3. When the king's decree was heard, Esther was taken to the king's palace into the care of Hegai. Verse 9. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her. 
besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. And so Esther is said to have pleased Hegai, the custodian of the women. There was something about Esther that caused her to stand out among the other young women to him. Now, the other young women were beautiful too. And yes, Esther was said to be lovely and beautiful. There was something that caused her to stand out to him. And so she won his favor. And so he readily gave her beauty preparations. And so the idea of readily or that these be given without hesitation. And so the decree said, let beauty preparations be given them. And so these young women. And when it came to Hester, he guy did so easily. It wasn't a difficult choice for him. He did so without hesitation. He did so readily, the text says. It says here that he did so in addition to her allowance. And so it says besides her allowance. And so in addition to her allowance, he gave beauty preparations. The text is literally her portions. And so he gave her preferential treatment in addition in that he, he gave her more than her portions. So it appears that he gave all the women their portions, but when it came to Esther, he gave more. In addition, he got provided choice maid servants for Esther from the king's palace. These would be her female attendants. They would attend to Esther. He then moved Esther and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. So note the words readily and best, best place. And so he's giving her this preferential treatment in comparison to the other women. The text here is her allowance. Uh, some have indicated this may refer to food to her portion of food. Uh, the text is literally her portions. It could include a, a number of things. Uh, the women gathered were to be given these beauty preparations. However, he guy saw that Esther received more than the others. Verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. According to the author, Mordecai had told his cousin, Esther, which he raised as a, as a daughter, not to reveal or make her known, uh, make her family or people known. Why? Why did he want her to conceal this information about her people or family? It may be, perhaps, that he thought that if they knew that she was a Jew, that she may be harmed in some, in some fashion. The text does not explicitly say the reason. However, if you compare it to the next verse, you can get an idea of what he, he may have meant, such as that she not be harmed. Uh, verse 11, and every day Mordecai passed in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. And so as a father for her, for his daughter, in this case, uh, a woman that he has raised as a daughter, his cousin, he paced back and forth in front of the court of the women's quarters where Esther stayed. And so he cared for her. He cared for her as if she was his own daughter. You can imagine if your daughter was, was taken here by order of the king as one of the many beautiful women, and these things were to be done. You can imagine how you might feel. Esther and the other young women studied, stayed in these women's quarters, Esther 2 and 3. 
and he paced. He paced in front of the court, walking back and forth every day to learn, waiting to learn of her welfare, uh, how she was faring, how she was doing, what had, was happening to her. He would not be permitted to, to enter those courts, the women's quarters. Uh, verse 12, each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation appointed, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. And so according to the decree, beautiful young virgins were brought to Shushan. Each one was given these beauty preparations. The young woman who pleased the king would become queen, Esther 2, 2 to 4. Now, according to this passage, each young woman would first complete 12 months preparation before their turn came to go in to the king. These beautiful beauty preparations included two parts, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes. And so here we see that each one would have their their turn to go before the king. Uh, Esther 4, 8 and 11, we see the words go into as well. Here in verse 13, thus prepared each woman, young woman was sent, went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. And so each young woman was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters where they stayed to the king's palace. This might include her choice of clothing or jewelry. You know, whatever she desired to take with her. Verse 14, in the evening she went and in the morning she returned to the second house of women, to the custody of Shaash Gaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. And so the young women, woman in this case, went to the king's palace in the evening and in the morning she returned this time to the second house of the women. This was the house of the concubines, the concubines of the king. The woman would be under the custody of Shaashgaz, the king's eunuch. She would not go into the king again unless he delighted in her and called for her by name. Uh, in, in the text, concubine is a female consort, um, generally with lower status than that of a wife. Uh, before a husband. And in this case here, we find that they would be with, under the guard of, of custody of this particular eunuch, Shaash Gaz. Verse 15. Now, when the turn came from, for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, to go into the king, she requested nothing. But what Hegai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Each young woman was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's court quarters, Esther 2.13. However, according to the text here in verse 15, Esther requested nothing. She took with her only what he guy advised, what he recommended. Esther had obtained the favor of he guy, according to Esther 2 and verse 9. Remember how he gave her preferential treatment. Now we read how she obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. And so not only he guy, 
favored her, but others, all who saw her, favored her. There was something about Esther. We see here in Esther her, her modesty. She requested nothing, nothing in addition to what was given other than what was recommended by Hei. We see here that she was not, she was not here by choice. She, along with the other women, were, were gathered. The beautiful young women were gathered. And then the king would choose from these women who pleased him. In this case here, she requested nothing. But we see the favor that she garnered from others, from the king's eunuch he got to everybody who saw her. But what about the king? Verse 16, of course, Mordecai cared deeply for his daughter and her welfare. He paced back and forth every day when she was there, wanting to know of her welfare and, and what she was doing, what was happening to her. It must have been terribly hard on him as well as her. Him not knowing what was going on, not being permitted to be there with her when he had been with her during her her life and raising her and bring, bringing her up. Verse 16. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus, it says, the 10th month. The 10th month was Tebeth. This would, been, this would have been in early winter. The summer was very hot in this place. And so we see here that they met early in the winter. The month, Tebeth, is the 10th month of the Jewish year, which corresponds to our, about to our January. And so the seventh year of the reign of King Ahasuerus, and if this Ahasuerus is Xerxes, this would place it about 479 BC. Comparing Esther 1, 1 to 9 with this passage, about four years had passed. About four years had passed since the first chapter, since the Feast of Ahasuerus, since the refusal of King v Queen Vashti to appear to show her beauty off to the king. And about four years had passed here since the royal decree against Vashti in Esther 1, 13 to 22. The period of time was from the third year of his reign in Esther 1, 3 to the seventh year of his reign of Persia in Esther 2 and verse 16. And so that would place the time period being about 483 BC to 479 BC. In Esther 2, in verse 17, it says, The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight, more than all the, other, more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. The author said that the king, King Ahasuerus, loved Esther more than all the other women. And so of all the women who were brought to him, he loved Esther more than them all. The term translated here as love has a wide range of meaning in the Old Testament. In this context, we see that the term refers to how she pleased him. The decree in Esther 2.4, then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. We see here in Esther that Esther obtained the favor of Hegai, the custodian, in Esther 2 and 9, and that she obtained the favor of all who saw her in Esther 2 and 15. And now we see that she also obtained, more importantly, the grace and favor of the king, King Ahasuerus. The term grace here has the meaning of being that she pleased or made a favorable impression upon the king. As such, the king showed her favor, which is often translated in the Old Testament as mercy or kindness. 
And so Esther pleased Ahasuerus, the king, and so he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Again, in the book of Esther, the term love is, has, a, has various meanings throughout the, through the Old Testament in different ways, such as used later with the term friends in Esther 5 and 10 and chapter 5 and 14 in relation to the family of Haman. And so we see here that King Ahasuerus was attracted to, to Esther. And so he favored her. She obtained grace and favor in his sight. And so he showed her this favor, this kindness or mercy. In chapter 2 in verse 18, then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and, for, and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. And so after King Ahasuerus, king of Persia, made Esther queen, he made a great feast. Again, Persia was the great empire of the day. This is also translated banquet. And so this feast or banquet, and you see it, the same term translated banquet later, such as in Esther 5, 4, uh, Esther 5, chap uh, chapter 5, verse 4, 6, 8, 12, 14, etc. Um, and so this great feast or banquet. And so the banquet was called the Feast of Esther. And so he held the feast for all his officials and his servants. To celebrate, the king proclaimed a holiday in the provinces. Again, remember there were 127 provinces. This was an official day of, of Esther. Official day of, of rest. This may have been a, this term may have been a, suggested a release from, or rest from taxes. And so when he talks about holiday, the term uh, refers to a release or to a rest. And so perhaps some have suggested a rest from tribute or paying tribute, paying taxes at that time, that holiday. And so the text also reads that he gave gifts. And so such a holiday with, with the Feast of Esther would have made her certainly more liked by all the people. And so he proclaimed a holiday and he gave gifts according to the hand, the generosity of a king. Second, we see in Esther 2, 19 to 23, how Mordecai foils the plot to kill the king. Verse 19, when virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. And so here we see that it was the second time, or at this time, that Mordecai sat within this king's gate. He was serving at the king's gate of the palace in the Shushan, in Shushan, the citadel. Verse 20. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. And so Mordecai told Esther not to reveal that she was a Jew. She obeyed him, even as she had obeyed him when he raised her, when he brought her up. Esther 2 and verse 7, when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. He cared deeply for Esther. He worried about her. He helped her in every way he could. In Esther 2, in verse 10, we saw how that Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had, char had charged her not to reveal it. When he talks about obeyed the command of, es of, of Mordecai, as when she was brought up by him, uh, this reminds me of the commandment, the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments of the law of Moses. 
Exodus 20 and verse 12, honor your father and your mother. No, Mordecai was not actually Esther's father. However, he was like a father. He was a father to her in that sense. He brought her up. He cared for her. Honor your father and your mother. And so here we see that Esther did honor her father. That is her cousin who acted as a father to her, Mordecai. We know from the Old Testament, from the law, that Israel was commanded by Moses to fear God and to keep his commandments. Now, as a Jew, Mordecai should have taught Esther these words. Now, the text of Esther does not explicitly mention God, for instance, the name God or the Lord. However, we see it in his province. And we'll talk more about the province of God as we get into uh, later chapters of Esther. But the things that are happening, keep in mind that these things are not just happening by accident. We see God working behind the scenes. We see the wisdom, the province of God in these events. And so Israel, as I mentioned, was told by Moses to fear God and keep his commandments. And as a Jew, we know that Mordecai, even though it doesn't say in Esther, would have taught Esther these words. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7, for instance. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Here we see the teaching of the Lord as, as told by Moses in Exodus 6, 4 to 7. Continuing with Esther, Esther 2 and verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, the doorkeepers became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So in those days, here he gives an indication of the time, while Mordecai served within the king's gate. And so at that time, that's where he served. At that time, there were two of the king's eunuchs. Again, the king had many eunuchs who he employed. And they served in different capacities, different, different functions. In this case, we see that these two eunuchs became angry, furious, with King Ahasuerus, so much so that they plan to lay hands on him, uh, lay hands on or to, to kill him. Big Fan and Teresh were doorkeepers, and so they were those who guarded the door. Given the behavior of the king, from what we see here uh, and read elsewhere, these men were probably not the only people to be angry with him, with the king. He was not a good man, this Persian king. The text does not say why they were furious with the king, only that they sought to lay hands on him. Would they be successful? Well, we'll see in a moment. I, I would like to note that a man by the name of Bigtha was one of the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus in Esther 1 and verse 10. And so that was some time ago, about four years ago. I don't, we don't know if he continued to serve in that capacity. But Bigtha was, was the same name used or similar name used at that time. Uh, this was when Vashti was queen. Now, in this passage, there's a man with a similar name to Bigtha. Here, he's called Big Than in Esther 2.21. Is it the same man? Well, the text doesn't say. He, too, was a eunuch. However, while he was a eunuch, too, he, he probably was a different man, I, based on the description. 
he was one of, in this case, this man, Big Finn, uh, was one of two of the king's eunuchs who served as doorkeepers. And so while, while this particular man was a doorkeeper, the other, other man mentioned earlier, years ago, was one of those in the presence, who served in the presence of the king. Uh, by the way, Esther two, 6 and verse 2 gives a variation on the spelling of the name, Big Fan, Big Fana. And so this was a variant of the same name. Of course, it shouldn't be surprising that names be spelled differently. In this case here, Esther chapter 2 and 21, we see these two king's eunuchs were upset with the king. They were angry, so much so they sought to lay hands on him. That was their plan. That was their scheme, their plot. Verse 22, so the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Again, the question comes up, why were they, why were the king's eunuchs, these two men, so furious with him? Who's to say? Uh, perhaps they were upset with King Ahasuerus because of his treatment of, of Queen Vashti. And so some have suggested that reason. Again, the text does not, does not say. It's left to our speculation as far as the text of Esther is concerned. Now, verse 22, it says, So the matter became known to Mordecai. And so Mordecai, who sat within the king's gate, learned of the plot of the doorkeepers to lay hands on King Ahasuerus, Esther 2.21. And so Mordecai told Esther, and Esther informed the king. He, she told the king in Mordecai's name. Uh, in Mordecai's name, uh, often when you talk about doing something in someone's name, it's doing so by their authority. And in this case here, we see that she told him based upon what Mordecai had said. And so she gave Mordecai credit when she told the king the information of the plot against the king. And so the king would have known of Mordecai, known of his name. If, if he wasn't familiar with the king at this time who served him at the gate, then he would know the name now. Verse 22, we see that this matter became known to Mordecai, and then she, he told the queen, Queen Esther, Esther told the king, King Ahasuerus, of course, mentioning his name, uh, Mordecai. Verse 23, and when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And so this brings us to our last passage today in, the, in, in this chapter. We see that the king ordered an inquiry be made into the matter. And so he ordered an investigation. He had a witness who said he heard of a plot to lay hands on him. And so he orders an inquiry to learn this information to, to make an investigation into the matter, into the plot, into what happened. And the results was that it was confirmed. The matter was confirmed. And punishment, they were killed. He says both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles of the Presence in the presence of, of the king. And so these, these men, Big Than and Teresh, were hanged on a gallows. The matter was recorded in the book of the Chronicles of records of the kings of Medea and Persia in the presence of King Ahasuerus. Esther 10, verse 2. The account included how Mordecai had told of Big Than, Big Thana, and Teresh who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. We see that later in chapter 6 and verse 1. And so this, this book of, the, of these events included not only of the plot, but who foiled the plot, Mordecai. 
Uh, I would like to mention here the the text reads hanged on a gallows. Some versions may read differently here. Uh, this described a structure from which criminals were, were hanged, these gallows. Uh, other versions read the same. Uh, however, older versions, older translations read hanged on a tree. Literally, the Hebrew refers to a tree or to wood. And so uh, some refer to being hanged on a tree or explained as being hanged on a gallows. And so uh, the idea uh, that these two men were punished for their crime. One version reads impaled on poles. And so whatever these wooden, this wooden frame or structure was, whether it was a pole or it was a tree, uh, basically it was wood of some kind. And, and the New King James uses the term gallows. Gallows typically made of wood. And so this frame on which to hang these, these criminals. So, and while the, the matter is a little ambiguous, we see that basically the, the idea is the same. They were hanged in some fashion. Uh, we see their punishment and certainly others would see as well. Well, that brings us to the end of the chapter. We hope that this has been helpful. We've, we've determined to, to stay with the text as much as we can in studying. We, at times, we'll look at information outside of the Bible, but for the most part, we're focusing on the words of the text itself, particularly from the New King James Version, which is the case of all, our, all, all of our studies in this program. And so we invite you to continue to study on your own and, and invite you to come back next time as we continue our study of the book of Esther with chapter three. Thank you for being here today.